Good morning. I'm Commissioner Annie Caputo, and it's my pleasure to chair this session and welcome you to Micro Reactors, the next big thing. My staff tells me the session had the highest number of registrations. There's clearly significant interest in this topic, which makes this session very timely. The purpose of the session is to examine how the potential for unique and diverse applications of micro reactors are stimulating interest across North America. This interest necessitates the NRC staff getting up to speed on the issues and technology of micro reactors to prepare for potential licensing activities. There is significant momentum from government and industry for clean, reliable power to replace fossil fuels. Micro reactors offer electricity and heat in niche markets such as remote locations, defense facilities, and backup generation. Safely deploying micro reactors raises unique issues for the NRC. Staff is engaging with stakeholders on unique issues related to oversight, autonomous or remote operation, transportation of fueled reactors, just to name a few. For additional information, I encourage you to read the information paper provided to the Commission last October, SECI 200093, and other, paper, other issues are also discussed in the information paper. And this was published in October of last year. The agency is also undertaking various initiatives to transform its regulatory framework to efficiently and effectively license and regulate micro reactors consistent with the nuclear energy innovation and modernization act the agency is increasing the use of risk insights and developing a new risk informed technology inclusive framework to safely regulate advanced reactors including micro reactors our panel will explore the drivers for micro reactors inclu including government plans to support them in non-traditional roles such as providing power in remote locations and defense facilities, or for resiliency and backup generation. This discussion will hopefully shed light on the impact for the NRC with regard to preparing for reviewing and licensing micro reactor technologies. I would now like to introduce our four distinguished members of the panel. Dr. Jess Jean, Associate Laboratory Director for Nuclear Science and Technology at Idaho National Lab. Dr. Jean joined Idaho National Lab in 2018 as Chief Scientist and was recently promoted to Associate Lab Director for Nuclear Science and Technology. He also recently served as the National Technical Director of the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy's Microreactor R&D Program. Dr. Dean worked at Oak Ridge National Lab from 92 to 2018, where he held several leadership roles. He holds a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from Kansas State University and a master's and PhD in nuclear engineering from MIT. And Dr. Dean is a fellow from the American Nuclear Society. We also have George Michael Rowe, director of DOE's Office of Arctic Energy. Mr. Rowe joined the Department of Energy's Arctic Energy Office on loan from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, where he has been a member of the research faculty since 2013. He holds joint appoint appointments at DOE's Idaho National Lab and PNNL. Prior to joining the University of Alaska in 2013, Mr. Rowe served in various engineering and management roles at Boeing for 35 years in research and development of aerospace-related energy, energy subsystem technologies. Mr. Rowe holds a bachelor and master's of science degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Washington. <clears throat> we also have Jeff Waxman, program manager for um, Defense Strategic Capabilities Office. Dr. Waxman is Program Manager for the Strategic Capabilities Office within DOD. Prior to this position, Dr. Waxman's federal service was for Congress and NASA. In Congress, he advised members, of science, members on science and technology issues. He then served as a Senior Policy Advisor for NASA's Administrator on issues of strategy, planning, and interagency regulatory reform. Before his federal service, 
Dr. Waxman worked in private sector for IBM, where he was a staff scientist on advanced semiconductor programs such as quantum computing and heterogeneous integration. His PhD is in physics from the University of Wisconsin, go Badgers, with a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Lastly, we have Mr. Robert Boston, manager of the Idaho Operations Office for DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy. He is responsible for overseeing the nation's leading nuclear energy research, development, and demonstration laboratory at INL. Mr. Boston has a master's degree in nuclear engineering in, and is a licensed professional engineer, a certified health physicist, and a federal project director. He is adjunct faculty member at Idaho State University, a member of the Idaho State College of Science and Engineering Advisory Board, and the Reactor Safety Committee. I'll now move to um, some administrative notes for the session. We will have two live polling questions, one question after the first presentation and another after the third presentation. When they are announced, you can access them by clicking on the polls link to the right of the video window next to the Q&A link. This is to keep you on your toes and also provide some real-time feedback to our staff and our speakers and to improve our engagement with the audience. At the end of the presentations, we'll conduct a Q&A session as time permits. And I look forward to hopefully a robust discussion. And with that, let's hear from our first presenter, Dr. Jean, with his presentation, Microreactor Research, Development, and Demonstrations at Idaho National Laboratory. Can I ask the technician to display the first presentation, please? Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And I'm very pleased to be talking as part of this, this panel. I'm gonna, as the title states, I'm gonna talk about the work that we're doing at Idaho National Laboratory uh, related to microreactors to bring them to fruition. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna start with sort of a timeline. I think most people are, are familiar with the history of Idaho and National Lab and the site and the demonstrations and re test reactors that we had. This provides a time timeline starting with the first reactor we had on our site in 1951 and progresses through noting some of the key key uh, reactor developments as the National Reactor Testing Station and you see it proceeds up to current times with treat restart being the most recent reactor that was brought uh, back online but with uh, plans for the future. So the next slide uh, talks about our plans for the future. Uh, this, you know, in, it gives a high level extension of that timeline where you can see how the different reactors that's being developed uh, fit into this, this schedule. So microreactors, of course, on the left-hand side are the nearest term. We see those reactors being developed and demonstrated by 2025 with, with several reactors under actively under development right now that closely followed by deployment. Uh, we're working on the versatile test reactor. Uh, you all are probably familiar with the advanced reactor demonstration program supporting two reactor demonstrations uh, this decade, and then also the uh, UAMPS new scale small modular reactor. So you see we're, we're continuing with the time timeline of developing and deploying micro or reactors in general, but micro reactors will be the nearest term. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to go through some of the things that we're doing at Idaho National Lab. And one of the, the most important to support demonstrations is the National Reactor Innovation Center led by Dr. Ashley Feynman. Uh, the National Reactor Innovation Center, referred to as INRIC, was established by the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act uh, and has objectives, as noted here, to support the demonstration of two advanced reactors. And from that timeline I just showed, you know, you, as you can see those are likely to be micro reactors. Um, there are a lot of activities that Enric is doing. I want to highlight two. Uh, these are on the next slide. Um, as far as test beds that will enable reactor demonstrations, one on the left is uh, related to the EBR2 dome uh, and using that. Uh, to support microreactor demonstrations. There's some pictures here of the dome. Obviously, a reactor operated in this uh, fast sodium cooled reactor operated in this dome for several decades, and uh, it's now available to support future reactors. 
On the right hand side uh, is a zero power uh, physics reactor cell that also represents a uh, existing location that we can can uh, use to develop and demonstrate reactors as well. So we're gearing up for those demonstrations and using the unique facilities that we have on our site. Next slide. Another activity, and this is, is, as the commissioner mentioned, a program that I previously led is the DOE Microreactor Program. It's now led by Dr. John Jackson, National Technical Director. Uh, the program vision here also is, is to perform research and development to support by 2025 micro microreactor demonstrations that will achieve, you know, the the objectives that we have for for uh, you know distributed nuclear energy. This program is different than NREC in that it's focusing on the R and D aspects as laid out. In the boxes at the bottom, you can see the uh, three technical areas on the right, system integration analysis, technology maturation, and demonstration support capabilities that will lead to these microreactor demonstrations and applications. Uh, the objectives of the program is to perform cross-cutting R&D that meets the, the needs to achieve the reactor development across these areas. So if we'll go to the next slide, we'll get into a little more detail. So we have a couple of experimental capabilities that we've stood up that's specifically designed to help reactor development. Uh, particularly this, the one shown here, single primary heat exchange extraction removal emulator sphere is a capability that we can use to form testing on, on single heat pipes. Uh, there's a picture of this in the left, lower left, and in the lower or the middle middle there, you can see a recent test that we did in heating up a heat pipe and its associated structure element. So we can do steady state transient thermal testing of heat pipes, which of course are a key element of, of some of the microreactor concepts that are being developed. Some of the stats are provided on the, the right hand side. Um, as you can as you can see this this is for a single heat pipe. We are also considering you know core segments and larger elements and this is covered on the next slide. So we, a larger scale facility that we're developing is called the Microreactor Agile Non-Nuclear Experimental Test Bed, a bit of mouthful, but easier to say a magnet. Uh, so this is a larger test bed. You can see in the lower, in the center there, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but a drawing, this is a vacuum chamber that we can, can put test articles in that represents microreactor core segments for heat pipe, gas cooled, or other reactor types. Uh, you can see the chamber size, five feet by five feet by 10 feet, apologize for the, uh, the non-metric units there. But uh, we can provide up to 250 kilowatts of power, uh, remove that heat, and then also connect this to other, other applications within the laboratory that is placed. Um, this is up and running now, and, and uh, we've we've uh, commissioned it and doing our first test. But I should mention that, that these facilities are available to support industry and happy to, to talk about that. Uh, next slide. This uh, is a uh, fisheye view of the laboratory that Magnet is in. And if you look in the sort of the center right, you can see a picture of Magnet's uh, environmental chamber. Uh, it's specifically placed in this laboratory to allow integration with with some of the other technologies that we're doing research on. So we have right, right to the left of Magnet thermal energy delivery system, which involves uh, thermal energy storage and, and transfer. We have high temperature electrolysis experimental capability in the uh, middle, middle upper part to support investigation of microreactor applications for uh, hydrogen production. To the left, uh, we have our vehicle and, and battery testing area. So uh, there's the, the ability to test microreactors uh, integration with batteries, battery charging. And on the right right side, uh, we have our our grid simulation, micro grid simulator capability to, to test how uh, microreactors can integrate with. Uh, microgrids and, and grids. So we have the capability to do thermal testing, we have the capability to do integrated testing in this uh, facility. Next slide. Okay, and then the, the, the next project I wanna talk about is, a, is actually a small reactor project we initiated called the Microreactor Applications Research Validation and Evaluation Project, or we call it MARVEL. This is a project where we're, we're actually developing a small 100 kilowatt reactor for integration testing. 
And to try to do this in a very rapid uh, time frame, you can see the time frame down in the uh, third bullet, late 2022, early 2023. Uh, this reactor is a small reactor, so we can, can develop it relatively quickly. Uh, we will be plan to place it in the treat facility and the existing nuclear facility, and then have it produce heat and electricity that we can then hook to uh, or integrate with applications. The first will likely be a microgrid application uh, for electricity, but there are also others to get this early stage experience with the development and the uh, integration of microreactors with an application. Uh, next slide. This provides just some high level details. I mentioned it's 100 kilowatt thermal power, 20 kilowatts electric, uh, can produce 450 C heat. Uh, it's a nat small natural circulation reactor using zirconium uranium zirconium hydride fuel, again, located at treat. There's a rendering of it on the, on the left side right there. Next. Okay, and then I just want to talk about an initiative we started thinking even you know, beyond some of the things that I just mentioned. We call it our fission battery initiative with the idea of thinking of these microreactors specifically as, as operating like a battery. And if you look, uh, the vision, you know, that's the vision of the, of the uh, project. If you look down below on the bullets and you think about what a battery is, uh, we've got some attributes here and we want to see how we can form research and develop technology that would enable uh, our microreactors uh, to operate in a similar way. They'd have to be economic, of course, if you think about your AA batteries, standardized, uh, installed, easily installed, easily removed, operate in an unattended uh, fashion uh, to make them easy to, to deploy and also being very reliable. And so uh, many of those, you know, many concepts already have most of these or several of these attributes, I should say, but we want to further that. We do have a series of workshops that have been underway. I, the remaining workshops in this series are on the, on the right hand side, transportation and siting, safeguards and security and safety and license and fission, fission batteries that may be of interest to some of the, the members here. Uh, and then next slide. Okay, and I just included some resources here of things I referred to if people want to follow up. So, Commissioner, that concludes my uh, talk. Thank you, Dr. Jean. Could I ask the technician to display our first polling question, please? What are the main drivers and markets for micro reactors? Viewers can select up to two among climate change microgrids and remote industrial sites, resiliency, disaster relief, military logistical support, and space exploration. So we look forward to uh, seeing your opinions as they come in. And thank you to those who have already responded. Our next presenter is Mr. George Rowe with Alaska and Microreactor Applications. Could I ask the technician to display the next presentation, please? Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to join you and to, to talk about some of the applications for reactors potentially in the state of Alaska and perhaps beyond in, in other parts of the Arctic region. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit about Alaska itself. So click again. Uh, Alaska is a small place in terms of population, but it's a very big place in terms of geography. Uh, nominally, it's on the order of almost two and a half times the size of the state of Texas, yet with fewer than a million people. And it's a challenging place in which to live and, and uh, work. Next chart, next click. It's remote. It's not tied in to any kind of a continental grid. And so everything has to be a standalone system. It needs to be able to operate in a self-sufficient self kind of a way. And, and so a lot of experience has evolved in Alaska in terms of how to make that happen. You see some examples on the right. In essence, these are all microgrids, some small, some large, some tied, some completely standalone, some remote, some in larger concentration areas. We'll talk a little bit about that, but there, there are estimates that indicate that more than 10% of the microgrids that integrate uh, renewables with fossil fuels are actually in the state of Alaska worldwide. And so next chart. 
uh, click, please. The challenge in Alaska is it is largely a resource and extraction given a uh, driven economy. And so what you have is remote sites that uh, are used to harvest uh, various materials. And this doesn't just include minerals or fossil fuels. It includes uh, seafood, timber, things like this. And so there are point source opportunities for using combined sources of heat and power, such as reactors, uh, micro reactors. But uh, next chart, the, the synergies don't just stop uh, with the multiple applications in Alaska. They go well beyond. I mentioned the circumpolar north. Uh, there are so many communities that are very similar to those in Alaska, in northern Canada, Greenland, et cetera, where uh, use cases can be compared and shared. And there are opportunities because of the small scale for uh, applications in Alaska that we can uh, gather lessons learned in the field and then extend them beyond. Next chart. In Alaska, it's impossible to find any kind of energy source or use uh, that is not found somewhere else in the world. It's, it's like a perfect test bed. This includes nuclear, by the way. Uh, the reactor that was in Alaska is no longer functioning, uh, but it was uh, decommissioned. But there's such a rich opportunity for looking at how Microreactors can integrate with other kinds of reactors and the various kinds of loads. Next chart. The, the challenge is that the, the loads are small when you think in a nuclear capacity, uh, down, down to about 100 kilowatts for some small communities, maybe a little bit less than a couple, up to perhaps 385 megawatts in the case of some of the largest utilities in the central part of the state. If you look in the, the graphic on the right, Toward the center of the slide, you see a uh, line going up and down. Uh, that, that region is about the only thing we have that's connected to each other. Everything else is, is uh, isolated. And so it's, it's in that large area that most of the, or all of the major military bases are located. They're part of that grid. We call it the rail belt grid. Uh, there's six utilities that are functioning there together. And so there's a very rich opportunity for exploring integration, different kinds of uh, loads. And there are brand new opportunities that are evolving as well as retrofit opportunities. Next chart. Back in 2009, the state of Alaska's legislature commissioned a study, which is performed by the Alaska Energy Authority and the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, looking at what at that time uh, were referred to as small modular reactors. Micro reactors weren't on the cards in the cards at that time, and looking at possible applications. The study was was completed. It did a very thorough review of the, the history of nuclear energy and, and nuclear uh, work uh, in the during the World War II time frame, uh, and it's available online. It's it's very very instructive for those who are interested in applications in Alaska. I'd strongly avail, uh, recommend uh, looking at at the resources there and some of the history in particular is captured. Now, remember that was back in uh, it was released in 2011. Within days of when it was finished, Fukushima happened. And so everything stopped in terms of interest in the reactors for a while. Next chart. But that's changed with the evolution of microreactors. And so working with uh, colleagues at the Idaho National Lab at the University of Alaska Anchorage, uh, this a study was done in terms of looking at what are the attitudes now toward uh, nuclear energy in the state of Alaska? Uh, there's some, some hurt that in some cases that that's, has to be addressed uh, responsibly, but there's also potentially emerging opportunities. Next chart. And so what happened is we did a, a combination of uh, like a customer discovery process, looking at a range of different stakeholders, asking questions and doing a, uh, a range of just kind of com comparing different insights and reactions uh, as as the concept of, of how would you feel about nuclear energy? How could you see it in the future? How could you use this source of heat and power, et cetera? What opportunities would it be developed? And all those with next, please. All of those results uh, were brought together in several different use cases uh, by different sectors. And so the, the topic areas are, are, I think, very representative 
beyond the state as well as within the state. And this has all been very thoroughly documented and I'll provide a link to this report at the end of the presentation next term. In addition, there have been a, a range of different stakeholder uh, information sharing sessions. Uh, we began back in April of 2019 uh, with a, an in-person session uh, in Anchorage. We had about 100 people that participated with us there. And then we've done some forums with smaller groups at the Alaska Forum on the Environment. And then more recently, last fall and then this January, we did some information sessions where we, it was a, a Zoom thing, of course, because of the, the virus uh, restrictions on gathering. But we, we explored these four different topics uh, that are shown here uh, it to, to gather input and to sh have experts from across the industry, uh, well outside of Alaska, to, to share thoughts and insights with, with uh, Alaska stakeholders. And then the study that I mentioned from 2011, that was updated. Uh, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power uh, coordinated that update. Uh, it looks at things that have changed uh, since the 2011 timeframe, both in terms of the technologies, licensing practices, uh, the various policies, and then the economics. Uh, in Alaska, uh, energy is very expensive. It's, it's crazy when you think about it in terms of the, the Trans-Alaska pipeline, et cetera. But in some cases, the, the cost of energy can be approach a dollar for a kilowatt hour in some remote locations. And, and heating fuel can, can be on the order of eight or eight or dollars per gallon or higher. And so interesting economic uh, aspects here. The challenge is the logistics and workforce and communications, all of these things. And so in light of these challenges and these opportunities, some next steps and recommendations were developed, which I think uh, warrant consideration. Next chart. So I'd like to kind of go through some uh, just quick flip examples of inputs from the stakeholders across the state. Uh, you can see here the range of applications that are considered. And in general, there's uh, an openness to ex uh, exploring possible uh, implementations of reactors, microreactors in the state, uh, but it's cautious and there, it wants to be done responsibly. Next chart. We're looking at uh, a range of applications. Defense sites were mentioned. One of the things I'd like to point out is for early deployment uh, of, of new technologies, <clears throat> it's important to be able to make sure that the application is ready to receive a technology. And so our large defense sites are combined heat and power installations. And so there are opportunities to uh, integrate sources of heat and power in existing distribution systems. The loads are very well characterized. There's not a lot of mystery. And there are very uh, a range of uh, security and uh, environmental preparation, et cetera, uh, provisions already in place. So defense sites seem like a very interesting application. Next chart. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the distributed uh, mineral extraction. They're, they're around different spots in the state. A challenge with integrating reactors into mining is the, the time frame for permits. Uh, once permits are started, it is very, very expensive to undo the permit and change the source of energy. And so there is some challenge in terms of uh, how can they reactors be integrated into existing uh, mining operations versus new ones? Next chart. In, in many parts of Alaska, we have uh, legacy systems that have, you see the center of some buildings on ADAC, they need to be destroyed uh, to make the system safe. Uh, reactors can provide incineration opportunities uh, in terms of doing that safely. You see waste uh, from a seafood processor on the right. You see uh, landfills uh, that need to have compact sources of, of dealing and dealing with waste that there's no way to haul it out of these remote locations. And on the lower left, that's an actual sewage lagoon. It's untreated sewage that is uh, allowed to accumulate and it percolates down for, uh, after a while. Uh, but it's, it's a, a challenge that sources of heat and power can be addressed. So waste management could be an interesting opportunity once we can get the technology where we need it. Next chart. And in, in addition, <clears throat> uh, we have many climate change situations in Alaska. If you would click again, this is not unique to the state of Alaska. 
uh, could you, uh, there are on the order of 31 communities that have been identified in the climate, climate act, requiring them to relocate. Uh, the, the opportunity and the needs for characterizing this effectively and looking holistically at energy solutions is very, very keen there and is, I think, appropriate globally as a, a, a need. Next chart. So I want to <clears throat> kind of talk through a, a couple of the 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 application deployment. So if you just click and click, so there's a whole range of different applications. Uh, there are different technologies, but we need to migrate techno the technologies through uh, lower risk settings to higher risk settings. And so the progression here is what I am recommending in terms of looking at defense and defense to municipal utility ties, then perhaps to remote industry and then municipalities, larger communities, and then maybe small communities. This is probably a 20 year evolution that we'd be looking at as the technology evolves. Always looking at the, the criteria there in the lower right, next chart. Uh, this chart shows you these defense and um, remote industry locations. You can see they're clustered in the center of the, the state. This to me seems like a logical place to concentrate initial efforts in terms of deployment of microreactors. Next chart. And I, I think it's really useful for developers uh, and, and people that are integrating, evaluating them to look at some of this, the actual documented loads uh, from some of our military sites because they provide some really great insight in terms of how the the, the loads change. This is 15 minute data from Fort Wainwright, which is in Fairbanks. Uh, you see the, the green line there on the top left, that's the electrical load. And you can see, of course, it's bouncing up and down uh, over a day as you might expect, but that's a whole year's worth of data. And what you see is it's not changing a lot during the year. So it's very, fairly steady state, not steady state, but it's fairly predictable. It's compared with the that uh, rainbow looking grayish curve. That's the daily temperature, the ambient temperature. The curve on the lower left, <clears throat> that's the steam that's output from the combined heat and power plant. And you can see that January is on your left and December is on your right. And what you can see is that the the heat demand varies very significantly depending on the temperature. And you see there's huge differences seasonally with the uh, heat and the heat to power ratio. So looking at solutions that combine reactors with either load following and load, load uh, heat to, to electricity, shifting capabilities, and integration with other kinds of uh, technologies for storage and perhaps uh, peaking kind of systems, very important. Uh, and some great on-ramps for some of the technologies uh, that Dr. Jean talked about being involved at I, uh, for testing at Idaho National Lab. So next chart shows the similar data for Eielson Air Force Base. Now this is on a monthly basis. It's four different uh, snapshot months. But again, it shows you, provides an opportunity of comparing the electrical uh, and the uh, thermal changes. And you can see again, the, the, the significant variation seasonally and that even within a given month, the, the changes in terms of the magnitude of either power or uh, of power in particular. Next chart. This is for a community in Alaska called Kotzebue. It's uh, north of the Arctic Circle, just a little bit. Again, you see the, the data for the electricity fairly flat, but it does have some seasonal changes. Uh, in, in terms of uh, one of the things that you see in some communities in Alaska is that the, the loads are seasonal. Schools operate during certain times year and industry operates at different times of the year and so like a seafood processor can be a major major element of a, a community's load uh, sometimes many many times the, the magnitude of the community load and so utilities have to be able to adjust their uh, resource uh, deployment to allow them to ad address these seasonal as well as daily the challenge that i want to focus on here is the fact that we don't have robust heating data, heat requirement data for communities uh, or of, of any size. 
Uh, we have estimates, we have models. Uh, one of the models is shown here. Uh, they're reasonable for estimating purposes, but we need better data. And this is part of the, the efforts that are ongoing in the state of Alaska. Next chart. Uh, there are a variety of technology needs that are documented that uh, will be of use to developers. Next chart. Uh, these include technologies that are highly germane to uh, microreactor integration, but there's needs for addressing other topics. This is something that we would be very, uh, very keen to explore uh, between the Department of Energy and, and other elements. Next chart. So next chart, quick. <clears throat> we want to make sure we're not a solution looking for a problem. We, we want to make sure we're engaging stakeholders and uh, talking with them from the poll perspective. Many questions need to be addressed. Chair, click please. It's important that we think about the people who are going to be using the businesses, uh, the timing of their needs, uh, where we should start, how we should deploy. Next chart. Addressing all of these factors, next chart. I want to close with uh, just why I think Alaska is a very excellent place to be considering uh, applications here. Uh, a wide range of uh, diversity and the needs, existing demonstration sites, small enough scale so that the magnitude of the investments is, is reasonable, and yet existing infrastructure available for tying in systems and there's just the street credibility of doing things in Alaska. So we believe that there's much opportunity for uh, deploying the technology uh, beyond the state of Alaska based on the lessons learned. Uh, could you click, please? Uh, globally, uh, next chart. Lots, lots to decide here. We need to, there's ongoing interaction with the legislature, with other stakeholders across the state. We'd like to see these applications characterized and represented in some of the testing that's ongoing at, in Canada, as well as in the United States, uh, multiple locations, bringing use cases to, to bear there, and then ultimately bringing the, the technologies north when the, the testing has validated them and shown that they are robust. Next chart. I want <clears throat> to thank you for your attention. Alaska's motto is North to the Future. I, I, with all of my heart, I believe this is a true application a statement here for us. Uh, those things that you can't read at the bottom right, those are actually hyperlinks to all of the documentation that I've shared. And I thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. That was very fascinating. Um, we've had one question about um, wanting to view a slide. And I just want to let everyone know that slides should be available on the NRC's REC webpage if you want to uh, peruse those again. Could I ask the technician to display the results of our first polling question? <clears throat> um, while we're waiting for those results to come up, our next presenter is Dr. Jeff Waxman with Project Pele Overview. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh. oh, let's, yeah. So let's just take a moment here to look at these drivers. So 43%, uh, obviously very strong for micro microgrids and remote use. Um, and, and of course, military logistical support and space exploration, 18% for climate change. So I, I guess, is there anyone um, on the panel who would just like to comment or make an observation about these numbers or whether they are um, surprising or about what you would have expected. Feel free to take yeah. yourself off. Yeah, this is Jess, uh, uh, Jess Jean. I'll make a few comments. This, this matches our experience. I think this matches what you heard in just the previous presentation of particularly first movers of having having needs for, for this scale of energy. And particularly when you look at the remote industrial sites and remote sites, the cost of energy is pretty high. And so from the competitiveness point of view, nuclear and micro reactors look pretty favorable there. And I would, I would 
expect and hope as they're developed that these other applications and areas listed here would, would become more, more prevalent given the, uh, the further development cost reductions. Thanks, Dr. Jean. Yes, I would um, just say that uh, uh, sure. resiliency and climate change, I, I view those as uh, interrelated. Uh, as we saw in Texas, it's important to ensure that uh, that uh, we have a, a resilient um, base load to provide the the electricity to the uh, the to the population, and uh, and maybe Dr. Jean can comment. But uh, the Department of Energy is working uh, across multiple labs with integrated en energy systems, and uh, and we find that that uh, that integration, as uh, as Dr. Rowe pointed out, and I believe Dr. Jean pointed out also, is is entirely imp important for this. Uh, a deployment of micro reactors. I agree. Um, all right, let's shift to Dr. Jeff Waxman with Project Pele. Uh, would the technician please display the next presentation? Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I want to second your important thought to, to go Badgers. Uh, and uh, when we, if you could advance one slide, you'll see what we call in the DoD the bottom line up front. Um, so the DOD has an energy problem. We have a huge need for energy. Um, we have difficult logistical tails. There's been a need uh, identified in a variety of places now, uh, executive order, uh, congressional language, et cetera. We believe Triso Fuel is a game-changing development that will allow us to make this feasible. Uh, we kicked off a two-year design competition back in March of 2020. Um, so we are a year into that now, and we remain on pace to do outdoor mobility testing this reactor at a DOE installation in 2024. Next slide, please. So um, th this need was driven in part out of what was seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, where 52% uh, of all casualties happen on land transport missions. Moving fuel and water around is most of what the DOD moves, and if there's some way to make the fuel and energy and water locally it's a it would be a big game changer for the dod so if you go to the next slide um this is a history lesson that a lot of people don't know that the army did this before uh the army built eight reactors in the 50s and 60s um they had uh, reactors in alaska as uh, george Rowe pointed out uh the image on the bottom right is a photograph that is a real mobile reactor that existed in 1958 so we've done this these were not very safe reactors. These are very primitive reactors. Uh, and when they were cutting things during the Vietnam War, trying to save money, uh, you had the fact that these reactors were simply more expensive. And so they were canceled. So we haven't seen them since in the Army. If you go to the next slide, uh, you get to the 2016 the Defense Science Board looked at this. And they said what I mentioned already, which is that energy needs are growing rapidly and energy logistics have never gotten harder. And they acknowledge that nuclear technology is a lot different from the way it was in the 50s and 60s. You no longer have to have um, people manually moving control rods in and out uh, centimeter by centimeter. And if you do it wrong, you get SO1. Uh, those sorts of reactors are not what we can build now. We can build uh, generation three reactors are operating all around the world. We can build uh, inherently safe reactors by design and, and largely autonomous. So, the DSB recommended that someone go around and actually do something about this. Someone should prototype a reactor was their recommendation. See if we can make this work. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is not really for this audience, but this is a slide I, I always drag around the Pentagon. And I like to remind them that whether the United States pursues this or not, our adversaries are. Uh, on the upper left there, that's the academic Lomonosov, which is the Russian floating nuclear reactor, which is in service. Uh, in Siberia right now, providing 70 megawatts of power. The upper right is uh, Vladimir Putin's nuclear-powered cruise missile, which is a terrible idea and I don't recommend. Uh, and on the bottom, I point out that um, China has a very similar problem to us in that China has built these artificial sand islands in the Pacific that are very important for their defense. And they're gonna have difficulty getting power there too. And so they have been very interested in reactors very similar to the sort of thing I'm talking about here and they're a first full generation four nuclear power reactor, the HTRPM. They claim it's going to start operations this year. So that's some photos of it on the bottom right. So if you go to the next slide, 
Um, we're really uh, relying heavily on triso fuel. So if you look at that image on the right, it looks like it cut away the earth. The idea is that uh, the red in the middle is the uranium. It is then surrounded by a spongy carbon material. And then around that is silicon carbide. And this has been tested by DOE and INL to 1800 degrees Celsius, which is really, really hot, as you probably are aware. Um, and this is a fuel that the Department of Energy has developed for us. And this is what uh, the DOD is looking for. We don't want it to have to develop our own fuel. We want to just use this one off the shelf. Uh, it has other uh, benefits for us uh, in that the fact that it's hardened should make it uh, resilient to proliferation. And also the fact that the fuel is separated amongst a million little pellets rather than uh, through larger uh, uh, components means that even in the case of a uh, kinetic attack, we don't believe that we would have that bad of a rate, radiological problem. It doesn't necessarily release all of your uh, radiation uh, components, but that's definitely something that we need to test, the same that the Army wants to see. Uh, the Army is not going to take these reactors on if they're going to have kilometer-wide evacuation zones uh, if things go wrong. So we uh, we know that this is a big part of the program and it's, it's, uh, it's in our plan. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a whole of government approach. The Strategic Capabilities Office is about 100 people, um, and most of them are doing other things. So we can't do this all ourselves, and so we depend very much on the help of our friends. Uh, so the Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission are both providing a variety of help from technical support, uh, safety advice. Uh, the NRC is, while they're not regulating this reactor, they are providing us a lot of input on making this what I call certifiable, NRC certifiable, uh, meaning that we want whatever we make here to be NRC certifiable, either for commercial spinoffs, but also to allow the DOD to have the option of letting the NRC certify the designs so that the Army doesn't have to ramp up their own naval reactors. Uh, the Department of Energy, in addition, is providing the safety oversight. So we're doing this uh, under a, a, the way a DOE reactor would be done. Uh, that also provides legal identification. Uh, on the NEPA, which is very important, it's my long schedule poll right now, um, we are working closely with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the Department of Energy. Uh, in terms of our uranium for this, we're using uh, HALU, 19.75%. Uh, we're actually getting HEU from the NNSA stockpile and we are going to downblend it to 19.75%. And then in terms of the TRIZO uh, facility where we're going to make it, we're doing that at BWXT Lynchburg. Uh, this is a joint interagency effort. This is a good, another good example of the government working together across agencies. The Na uh, NASA and the Department of Energy are working on this together. We are joint funding this. Uh, and then once the line is fully up and producing, uh, each agency will buy whatever they want by, uh, by the pound. But we want to make sure that it's an interagency effort to, to make this fuel uh, happen. Uh, next slide, please. So where are we since we kicked it off last year? In fact, when we were going to have this panel a year ago before COVID canceled it, uh, I was going to announce that we just started uh, designing the reactor. So since then, we've gone all the way to a preliminary engineering design, uh, what the DOE calls a 50% design. We had those reviews in late January. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we are in the process of down selecting. Uh, the three companies we were using were BWXT, Westinghouse, and X-Energy. Uh, after that PDR, we've down-selected from three to two, uh, and you should expect to see an announcement about that probably uh, Monday, maybe Tuesday, uh, that will announce what, what those, which two of those three are moving on. Um, we are on pace for final engineering design due uh, no later than March, probably February of next year, to allow construction to begin in, in mid-2022, assuming we choose to do that. Uh, the Army has stood at the Army Mobile Reactor Advisory Council to advise us on the technical specifications and requirements. Um, that's very key for us. We want to make sure that uh, we don't just build a nuclear reactor that goes in a mu uh, museum. We want to make sure that this is something that the Army can actually use, that this first-of-a-kind reactor meets some low-hanging fruit needs that the Army has. Uh, we're proceeding. Um, I'm not going to read all these things here other than... Um, to point out that we are on pace here with the regulatory front and on the nuclear fuel and on NEPA and everything else. So uh, we uh, basically, the government will make a decision uh, on what they want to do in 2022. Do we want to fund the construction of this reactor? Um, and so we will have two final engineering designs. And at that point, we will decide whether we're going to build or not. So if you go to the next slide, um, my first two big black bullets here are uh, things that, well, actually, I guess all three, really. 
are things that I think everyone can agree here, which is, uh, A, uh, nuclear power is a potential paradigm shift. Uh, moving colossal amounts of fuel around every day, which is what the DOD is, does right now, is not just expensive and not just bad for the climate, but it's a huge vulnerability that the DOD has. We are very dependent upon the electrical grid. Um, and the odds are that your worst day for electrical grid is going to be the day that the DOD really needs it. So that's a huge problem. Um, at the same time, we know that this is really hard. It's not just building a nuclear reactor. It's what is the regulatory regime? How do you make sure that all the environmental rules are satisfied? How do you make sure the supply chain is there? Because uh, right now, I don't think the supply chain is there. Um, how do you make it cost effective? What, how do you employ these things? What, how do you train people in the army to operate these? There's just a lot of things we got to figure out. And that, that's the really hard part in this program. But we hope that uh, there's been a promise for a long time about actually building uh, micro reactors, truly advanced non-light water reactors. And we believe that Pele can be the pathfinder. Uh, the Strategic Capabilities Office, we are a rapid prototyping organization. We make prototypes happen. And so we intend, assuming that the funding is there, to build this reactor. And we hope that uh, this springs out a commercial sector that has a lower regulatory risk and lower financial risk and can actually feel confident that they can make these happen. So uh, we are optimistic uh, in the way the designs are going. And we hope that in 2024, we'll have a, a reactor somewhere that's powering light bulbs. Um, and that's all I had to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Waxman. It's a very, very exciting time, certainly with the DOD engagement on advanced designs and microreactors. Um, can I ask the technician to display our second polling question, please? What are the biggest impediments to deploying microreactors? Viewers can select up to two. Financing cost and return on investment, technology development, Availability of nuclear fuel slash supply chain, uh, lack of performance history, regulatory risk, licensing and authorization, uh, and defined market needs. And while folks are thinking about these and pondering their selections, uh, we will hear from Mr. Robert Boston with his presentation. DOE safety authorization process for new test reactors. And would the technician please display Mr. Boston's presentation. Well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity, uh, Commissioner Camuto, to participate in this panel. Very exciting. Um, uh, next, uh, we can put the presentation up, please. Thank you. Um, so as, uh, as Dr. Waxman dis discussed, uh, DOE is the your authorization uh, authority for the Paley reactor. And so we'll discuss that uh, process here. I uh, just want to mention on the cover slide, uh, the ATR uh, core is shown on the left. Uh, I'll dare say that it's the uh, world's most flexible test reactor. And on the very right is a, a rendition of the tr transient reactor test reactor or TREAT, which I'll discuss um, further uh, coming up. Uh, as I go through this presentation, um, when I discuss uh, documented safety analysis, uh, that is equivalent to the uh, NRC uh, final safety analysis reports. That uh, terminology changed in 1991 for DOE. And uh, if I bounce back and forth, there are some uh, legacy facilities that, that use both terms. Uh, similarly, technical specifications in DOE parlance are called technical safety requirements. And uh, please, uh, next slide. So I want to provide a historical context. The DOE, DOE grew out of the uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission and uh, some uh, Manhattan Project. Uh, key historic themes from that uh, outgrowth was we had a culture of production uh, focused on a military or wartime mission. We had a closed and secret system versus transparent. Uh, 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 autonomy um, was, or authority and autonomy was uh, varied depending on the, the mission. And we were production focused over safety and environment. Uh, when Abra Watkins came in that, that uh, we had a paradigm shift and today's contemporary themes are, we ensure we have uh, technically qualified staff. <clears throat> we focus on a premier <clears throat> organizational culture uh, we have a system called integrated safety management, which we test the uh, 
the flow down from the uh, the rules, code of regulations, all the way down to the contractor's procedures. We focus on environmental stewardship. Uh, we do adopt commercial nuclear standards and NRC standards, and we focus also on community engagement, which includes uh, citizens advisory board boards, uh, outreach to local communities, and certainly outreach to the Native American tribes. Next slide, please. Uh, as you're aware, numerous technologies are coming into play, molten salt reactors, gas-cooled reactors, unique fuel designs, as Dr. Waxman said, uh, TRISO is, will be a game changer. Uh, there's a broad size, range in size and functionality, as Dr. Jean discussed, uh, the Marvel reactor, uh, 100 kilowatts up to a versatile test reactor, and DOE is uh, 300 megawatts. Certainly a rapid pace of pro progression in the technology life cycle. A lot of additional data is needed. Uh, so DOE has to have a regula regulatory framework that is rigorous, flexible, and adaptable. Next slide, please. You're probably familiar with this. We call this, uh, this graphic the valley of death. Um, basic science is developed in the universities and the uh, national labs that flows into the uh, basic to applied science and, and then to applied engineering. That's where uh, national labs, such as the Idaho National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, Argonne National Lab, to, among others, can assist in the development of these technologies. And then certainly DOE can assist with the uh, demonstration and deployment for technology readiness levels, uh, such as uh, TRL 789, where it's not quite ready for commercialization. And at this point, uh, we engage with our NRC partners, um, such as we're doing with Pele, to, uh, to help assist in uh, authorization and commercialization of that technology. Next slide. Uh, national lab capabilities, I won't spend a lot of time here because Dr. Jean talked about it, but uh, the National Reactor Innovation Center uh, enables deployment, the gateway for advanced advancements in nuclear or gain, uh, provides nuclear energy industry with access to technical, regulatory, and financial support necessary to make innovative nuclear technology gains. Uh, we engage in public-private partnerships, uh, allow access to nuclear, the, uh, the DOE nuclear labs and collaboration. DOE also has fuel fabrication and development capabilities, and we are working with some vendors on uh, providing those capabilities. And DOE assisted uh, the NRC in the licensing modernization project and the technology inclusive content of application. Uh, we are uh, becoming a lead in cybersecurity. Uh, certainly, uh, labs like Oak Ridge have a, a tremendous supercomputing capability. Next slide. So the DOE authorization process uh, supports advancements of this uh, uh, technology. Uh, we call, instead of licensing, we call it the authorization basis, provides a reasonable assurance of worker, public, and environmental protection. Uh, we have the same safety goals as the NRC. Um, here at the IATO National Lab, I am the uh, authorization official for the, the new reactors that we'll deploy here. And I've challenged the contractor to, uh, to go beyond the safety goals. And uh, I, I would like to see no design basis events that challenge our local guidelines beyond the facility fence line. Now that's a, that's a lofty goal, but I think with the fuel such as TRISOL, it's certainly achievable. Um, we have a regulatory environment that's designed to support a broad array of capabilities and needs, uh, fuel fabrication uh, and reactors. Uh, we are, very involved in national security missions other than Pele, and, and uh, we have complex and multi-mission nuclear R&D facilities across the complex. So as I talked about before, we have to be technically rigorous, flexible, and adaptable. We have to use upfront tailoring as approach to best fit the application. And this is where I'll, I'll uh, go back to the TREAT reactor, transient reactor test. When it was decided that uh, TREAT had to be restarted after more than 20 years of being shut down, 
uh, to meet the goals of the advanced uh, uh, accident tolerant fuel program. Uh, it had a very short turnaround and we were able to, uh, from start to finish, uh, rewrite and approve the uh, treat uh, documented safety analysis in 18 months. And we did that by um, sitting down with the contractor whenever we had difficult situations. Uh, we did not send over requests for information. If we had questions, we arranged a meeting, we sat down and we worked through uh, those questions and verbally, and then we followed it up with uh, formatted uh, formal comment response where we had uh, issues and we did have some issues. Uh, we sat down and, and uh, focused sessions and resolved those issues between the contractor and the and my staff. And we were able to, again, uh, be successful uh, in that project in a, in a uh, documented safety analysis approval in 18 months. Next slide. Uh, the relationships of the regulatory requirements for not those not familiar with uh, DOE, um, the, the outer or the purple oval is the contract. This provides us uh, somewhat more flexibility than the NRC because we can provide uh, incentives for positive performance and safety and security and, and program or project performance. And we can also penalize uh, in the incentive for uh, safety or security performance in that area. This is also where we flow down the the uh, the, uh, the requirements below the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, we'll get to this in the next few slides. Uh, we call them DOE orders. So they flow down into the contract, and we can tailor those for the specific contract. Um, the next oval, the inner uh, authorization basis. This includes the uh, the safety basis, which is the inner oval. Um, but also includes environmental protection. Um, it includes emergency management and the security plan. And this is where the, uh, the DOE Office of Enforcement, which is uh, DOE wide, can take uh, uh, enforcement actions against safety and security issues, uh, uh, leverage civil penalties against the contractor if needed. And then finally, the internal oval, uh, the inner oval is a safety basis. This includes the documented safety analysis, so in, in NRC parlance, similar to a license, technical safety requirements, DSA commitments, um, uh, which are equivalent to 50-50, um, sort of equivalent to the license commitments, uh, the DOE uh, safety evaluation report, and the unreviewed safety question process. And, and the USQ process was modeled, uh, uh, plagiarized, I'll say, from the NRC's 5059 process. The next slide. Our regulatory structure flows down from the DOE policy, which is signed by the secretary, uh, down to uh, the Code of Federal Regulations or the rules, uh, the DOE orders, you can also hear them described as directives, implement the, the rules, and then manuals and standards uh, uh, implement uh, the orders, but those are generally uh, laid out in the contract, specific contract for the, uh, the labs. And then finally, we have guides, which are uh, assistance on how to uh, uh, implement the orders themselves, but guides are generally not part of the contract. Next slide. Uh, this is very similar to what the, uh, the NRC does as far as uh, hazards and safety analysis. So I won't go into details. All I'm going to uh, say about this slide is, is we leverage many uh, NRC documents for our approval process. Uh, for instance, uh, for the reactors that we're uh, authorizing at this time, uh, new reg 1537, as well as industry standard uh, ANS 15.21, uh, we have just developed a new DOE standard, uh, uh, standard 1237, which is called Documented Safety Analysis for DOE Reactor Facilities, and uh, Reg Guide 1.232, which is Design Requirements for Non-Light Water Reactors. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, just to highlight uh, some of the, um, for those not familiar, uh, some of the, uh, the DOE requirements that flow down to uh, nuclear facilities and their 
for document safety analysis. So in this example, 10 CFR 830 nuclear safety management rolls down to DOE order 420.1C, which is facility safety, which then implements numerous standards uh, and, uh, and other um, uh, industry standards. For example, in the middle, DOE standard 1066 really uh, implements many uh, national fire protection codes. And as I previously stated, uh, for the, uh, the the reactors, we've got a new DOE standard, and we've also uh, are leveraging uh, Reg Guide 1.232. Next. So, in summary, uh, DOE is uniquely qualified to assist the the industry and the NRC uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, new reactor technology. Uh, we have a very similar process to the NRC. Uh, for um, authorizing uh, DOE reactors. And we have uh, uh, the same adequate protection standards for the public, but uh, we are striving to ensure that we have a very low uh, design-based accident doses at the public boundary. And so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boston. And thank you to all of our presenters. Can I ask the technician to please display the results of our second polling question? The biggest impediments, cost, number one, and regulatory risk, a close second. Um, would any of our speakers like to comment? Don't forget to unmute. I, I would uh, say that uh, that the regulatory risk of licensing is a is a um, adds to the financial risk. Uh, we are DOE is assisting with the licensing basis for UAMP's new scale at the Idaho National Lab, and uh, and that is uh, is a driver. And and again with uh, Project Pele and some of the other uh, demonstration technologies, uh, we can DOE can certainly assist in reducing that risk. Mr. George, uh, I'd add in on that. Uh, as we've interacted with uh, community utilities, the unknowns in terms of the costs and, and the relatively high cost compared to what is already installed is a very significant issue uh, in terms of embracing the technology. And one that I think creative uh, like power purchase agreement and other kind of financial arrangements might be for helping with the earlier adoption. Yeah, I would also add that um, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily rank them. I would almost invert the question if they all matter, because if any of those things fail, you're not going to get there. And I, I think in TRL parlance, to use sorry technical term, but we like to say that if your design has 10 subcomponents and they're all TRL 9, except for one key subcomponent that's TRL 5, your whole design is TRL 5, because if that one thing doesn't work, you're not going to build it. So we have to make sure all these things advance. Because if any one of those areas is not solved, then you're not going to have real tangible nuclear reactors powering things. That's a very good point. Um, you know, I think I'd like to go back to George uh, with our first question. So the question is, why do you think a microreactor will be economical? Even in Alaska, where you have high energy costs, the cost for a microreactor can still be expensive, considering the upfront costs. Yeah, I, I think that, like I, I said earlier, that, that is a very big unknown. The, the challenge with implementing a reactor in a high cost of energy setting is you have to realize it's not just the, the source of power that is the cost driver. There's also all of the utility management, et cetera. That, that's there regardless of whether the, the system source is a nuclear one or a diesel source or something in between. And so it's important as developers are evaluating different opportunities for their technology to be mindful of what the cost elements are. And I think that's why it's so important to be in communication as several of the speakers have talked about with the end users to understand what are their cost drivers, et cetera. I, I think that the challenge of economics is, is why you want to go to places where they will pencil faster 
in in some cases, but the technology's got to be ready and robust enough to to not introduce a, a risk that could uh, unfortunately take take back the whole industry if there was a, a adverse situation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think I'd like to direct our next question to Dr. Waxman. We heard a fair amount from Mr. Boston about DOE's licensing process. Um, can you talk to us about the licensing requirements at DOD and what, what the process entails? So we're, we're kind of in a bit of a gray area here because the <laughs> DOD has, author, uh, has authority to really regulate itself. So the Navy, for those who are not aware, uh, regulates itself, but they do audits with groups like the NRC to make sure that they have some over um, some other people looking into what they're doing. But in terms of what the Army would do, we actually have the opportunity here to really recreate it from scratch. Um, and so right now we're working with the Army on multiple different ways that they might regulate this. Um, and like I said, my, my preference is really to uh, push a lot of that work off onto groups like the NRC because I don't think it's going to be good if the Army has to hire dozens of uh, uh, technology experts the way that the Naval Reactors has. It, it creates a huge upfront cost for something for which we don't know. There's a lot of huge upfront demand, but there is an Army Reactor Office. Um, there, we, the Army is starting to, uh, the, actually I'll also point out that as of a few weeks ago, the Army Corps of Engineers now has a nuclear power branch. So we are starting to put the pieces in place, but they're still just pieces and it's a long way to go before the Army really finalizes how they re would, would regulate this. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Jean, you mentioned fission batteries. Is there a possible application of that technology in space? In space? Commissioner, did you say in space? In space, sure. right. Are there possible space applications for what you're looking at or is it slightly different? Well, we're not specifically looking at that with the fission battery initiative, but the technology is very related to particularly the uh, you know fission surface power and electrical power in space. And, the, and certainly NASA has activities and, and interests that they're working on with the Department of Energy uh, using nuclear energy in space. So they're so while our application is really looking for for applications on Earth. Uh, the technology is fully applicable and can be extended for, for space nuclear power as well. All right. I'll, uh, I'll pose this question to Dr. Jean and Mr. Boston. What are the main challenges that you see with the verification and validation of computer codes for micro reactors? Bob, you're here. You're on mute. Would you like to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for my particular uh, 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 focus right now is on uh, fuel qualification. And, uh, and so uh, the VNV of computer codes that can lead to, uh, to uh, adequate uh, fuel verification so that I, uh, we can in fact authorize these reactors is my, my lead concern. There, there's a lot of other uh, issues uh, with VAV, but those those uh, those are long term challenges. And uh, for example, for the Marvel reactor uh, to meet the goals of the timing, they're going to be using trigger fuel, which is well characterized. So that is less of a concern for me. Yeah, maybe not. I'll add add to that. I mean, a lot of our data for VNV or validation in particular comes from these legacy reactors, some of which I, I talked about. So we rely heavily on that. But one of the purposes you know, of the experimental capabilities I talked about is to generate data specifically to help validate uh, some of our new codes, uh, you know, measure things in more detail. And then I think these demonstrations themselves offer really, you know, the first time in my career to, to be able to collect data in real time uh, to support validation that can then can be used as, as the reactors are commercialized. So it's really a unique opportunity, not only leveraging what's been done before, building up the experimental infrastructure, but actually having these operating demonstrations that can, can support, you know, further data. Well, we have come to that point in our conversation where we have to acknowledge that we are what stands between people and lunch. 
And so I would like to thank our presenters for taking the time to appear today and share their thoughts. I think it was a fabulous discussion. I'm sure, you know, we could continue with Q&A um, for, for quite a long time, um, but they are going to give us the hook uh, momentarily. So thank you everyone for participating today. And uh, with that, I will turn control back to the technician and wish everyone a happy and healthy lunch. And hopefully you will return to the Rick in the afternoon. Thanks, everyone.